This is a pre-recorded presentation, so the presenter will not be taking any questions. However, all questions asked during the live presentation, along with answers, are included at the end of this presentation. To learn more about our upcoming patient and family conferences in your area, please visit aamds.org slash conferences. To view other recorded presentations or to register for other live online learning events, please visit aamds.org slash learn. Hello, welcome to our live webinar titled, Welcome to Myelofibrosis, From Diagnosis to Treatment. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lee Clark, Information Specialist at AAMDSIF, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I would like to acknowledge Celgene, Takeda, and the generous support of our patients, families, and caregivers for providing support for this webinar program. Today's presenter is Dr. Michael Kang. He holds a clinical facility appointment in medicine in the Division of Hematology Oncology at UVA Cancer Center. He practices at the Emily Curick Clinical Cancer Center in Charlottesville and serves as an inpatient hematologist at UVA Hospital. His clinical areas of interest are myelodysplastic syndromes, myeloproliferative disorders, acute myeloid leukemia, chronic myeloid leukemia, acute lymphoid leukemia, and aplastic anemia. He attended medical school at Michigan State University and completed internal medicine residency at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, California. He completed fellowship in hematology oncology at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, and in 2014, where he served as chief fellow from 2013 to 2014. Dr. Kang joined the University of Virginia in 2014. With that said, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Kang. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Lee. Um, wanted to thank you uh, for everyone joining in today and uh, listening. And uh, just thank you to the Aplastic Anemia and MDS uh, Foundation for giving me the opportunity to present. The topic of my discussion today is on myelofibrosis uh, from diagnosis to treatment. I do not have any disclosures. The objectives today are listed on the slide. We are going to talk about the diagnosis and treatment of myelofibrosis. We're going to talk about the causes and possible symptoms that a patient may feel and how to take control of a patient's care and uh, general questions that a patient should ask um, his or her physician. The overview of today's presentation are as follows. We're going to have a brief overview in epidemiology of myelofibrosis. We're going to have um, a discussion on diagnosis, prognosis, treatment, and then a brief um, look into current clinical trials and future directions in the realm of myelofibrosis and end with some concluding remarks. So to start off with, we're going to talk about um, overview in epidemiology. Myelofibrosis is a, a subcategory of uh, overarching group of neoplasms. They are called myeloproliferative neoplasms, or NPN for short. The definition of NPN is a group of clonal myeloneoplasms in which a genetic alteration occurs in a hematopoietic progenitor cell, leading to proliferation resulting in an increase in peripheral blood, white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, or a combination of these cells. So in layman terms, basically NPNs are a group of disorders, they are cancers, that lead to an increase, so too much production of one of your counts. That's the white blood cells, red blood cells, or platelets, and it could be one or more of these. For myelofibrosis in particular, it occurs in about 1 to 1.5 per 100,000 people in the United States. The median age of diagnosis is 65. It occurs slightly uh, in men more than women. Um, currently, there is uh, not a specific cause that's known that's uh, linked to myelofibrosis. However, some prolonged chronic exposures to industrial solvents and radiation exposure has been thought to lead to the diagnosis of myelofibrosis years afterwards. The amount of radiation exposure is not 
one that you can receive by just getting a simple chest x-ray. Rather, it's uh, those patients who uh, received radiation exposure, such as with the atomic bomb in Japan. There's a slightly higher risk in patients um, who are Ashkenazi um, Jewish. Um, this is a brief slide that, this, that looks into um, hematopoiesis in the body. So um, in the bone marrow itself, we all start with the cell on the very, very left-hand side, and this is the all-potent, uh, peripotent uh, stem cell. It slowly divides into myeloid cells and to lymphoid cells. The lymphoid cells are on the top two rows. They form your T and B lymphocytes, and they can cause, um, uh, they help form uh, regular lymphocytes. Your myeloid cells form your erythrocyte, which is red blood cells, your megakaryocyte or platelets, and then a whole slew of other white blood cells that are um, used uh, for your body's defense. If there is a alteration or a genetic mutation in any one of these particular cells, that can lead to a cancer, particularly a leukemia or a lymphoma. From our standpoint, for myeloproliferative disorders, if there's an alteration within the red blood cell, that leads to polycythemia vera. If there's an issue with the platelets, that leads to essential thrombocytosis. And for myelofibrosis, it could be any one of these that leads to myelofibrosis. Um, this is a slide that looks at all the myeloid diseases all together. And I like this slide because it kind of shows you how there's a bunch of overlap. So the main one that we're talking about today is mild proliferative neoplasms. But in this Venn diagram of diseases, you can see that there's overlap with myelodysplastic syndromes and overlap with acute myeloid leukemia. So it's very important that when you receive a diagnosis of mild proliferative neoplasms, that it truly is that correct diagnosis, meaning that since it's very close to things that look like myelodysplastic syndrome or acute myeloid leukemia, you want to be absolutely sure that the diagnosis is correctly um, um, looked at and verified by a hematopathologist. We'll go over the exact definitions uh, in the next slide, next few slides. So, the myeloproliferative neoplasms uh, con uh, consist of a whole slew of um, uh, disorders. The main ones are listed up here in the first four. They include chronic myeloid leukemia, or CML, polycythemia vera, TV, essential thrombocytosis, ET, or, sorry, and myelofibrosis, MF. And in my presentation, I'm going to be using the abbreviation MF for myelofibrosis. There are additional um, myeloproliferative neoplasms that are less common, and they are listed on the slide as well. That includes systemic mastocytosis, hyperacidophilic syndrome, chronic myelomonocytic leukemia, chronic neutrophilic leukemia, and chronic eosinophilic leukemia. These names um, sound very complicated. They share a lot of the same characteristics, but their genetics and how treatment is offered does vary between each one of these subtypes. So I um, urge all patients who receive a diagnosis of a myeloproliferative neoplasm to go through this uh, diagnosis very carefully with his or her oncologist and um, a pathologist to make sure that the correct diagnosis is made so that prognosis and treatment options could be offered correctly. Um, I'm, I'm going to give the definition of the main myeloproliferative neoplasms because I think it's very important to distinguish between the first four, and after that, I'll be spending my time and focusing specifically just on myelofibrosis. Um, CML usually occurs with leukocytosis with a left shift. What that means is that there is usually an increase in white blood cells with many early immature white blood, white blood cells being seen specifically something called the basophil. There could be a mild anemia, meaning a lower white, oh, sorry, a red blood cell count, and there could be a normal to elevated platelet count. So that's usually what's seen in CML. For polycythemia vera, this is usually occurs with a very elevated red blood cell count. So the hemoglobin and the hematocrit on the complete blood count can be um, seen to be very um, high. There may be a slightly increased white blood cell count, and a platelet count. And uh, the third 
uh, myeloproliferative disorder is essential thrombocytosis, or ET. That occurs with a very high platelet count. And once again, it could occur with a smallly, uh, sorry, a mildly increased uh, white blood cell count and um, hemoglobin as well. Now, let's review the diagnosis of myelofibrosis uh, in particular. So, myelofibrosis, these are the common signs and symptoms that patients pr uh, present with, and this is what you want to think about. So, when, per when patients talk about having fevers, night sweats, unintentional weight loss, and it's usually about 10% of your weight over the last uh, two to three months, fatigue, abdominal bloating, abdominal pain, bowel irregularities, um, bone pain and pruritus or itchiness. Those are the main symptoms of myelofibrosis. Signs that a patient, physical exam signs that a patient has myelofibrosis includes an enlarged spleen or liver, um, peripheral edema, which is swelling in the um, hands and legs, gout, arthritis-like symptoms, um, portal hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, and that is specifically relating to the spleen, liver, and lungs can cause some backflow that leads to complications. You can have petechiae or ecchymosis, and that is basically bruising that's noted on your body um, that occurs due to low platelets, and also lymphadenopathy, which are enlarged lymph nodes. That was a big mouthful, but what I'm planning to do is go through each one of those right now. So, um, based on a uh, recent publication in 2017, Harrison et al. basically pulled many patients with myeloproliferative uh, neoplasms. And the overwhelming symptom that patients present with is uh, fatigue. Um, approximately 50% um, <clears throat> of patients with myelofibrosis uh, have fatigue. This graph is really nice because it compares the uh, polycythema vera and essential thrombocytosis with the symptoms. The next most common symptom includes abdominal discomfort, shortness of breath, night sweats, and difficulty sleeping, and bruising. Those are the main myelofibrosis symptoms that do occur. Um, patients have approximately, approximately 40% of patients have an enlarged um, liver and spleen, and that's what's leading to the abdominal discomfort, which does lead to the shortness of breath as well. This next slide is a nice uh, figure that kind of goes over the um, basic um, background of what leads to all these issues. I'm going to be reviewing some of, of the genetics, but uh, the big thing that you uh, hear in the news with myelofibrosis and the myeloproliferative neoplasms is this jack protein, which my cursor is over right now. This jack protein, or even this NPL protein, can lead to dysregulated a jack stat pathway. This specific pathway is signaling that is recognized um, as a central mechanism of myelofibrosis. So, um, if this jack stat pathway is un or dysregulated, it can lead to many complications which are the ones here um, on the right-hand side of this cell. And the first one is EMH. EMH is basically extramedullary hematopoiesis. For the lack of better words, it's basically when your bone marrow does not operate or does not function well, your body tries to be smart and tries to form bone marrow outside of the bone marrow. So EMH can occur in many different places. So your bone marrow tries to find places to create more bone marrow, and more often than not, that's the spleen or the liver. And so this slide says splenomegaly, which is uh, the spleen. And so the spleen and the liver can be enlarged. EMH can occur anywhere. Um, I've had patients who EMH occurs in the lungs, which leads to shortness of breath. Some, some occur along the spinal cord, which causes very severe back pain or even neurologic compromise. And I've even had one patient whose uh, EMH occurs in the brain, which caused stroke-like symptoms. Um, if EMH occurs in the spleen and there's a back fill and back pressure, that can lead to portal hypertension and lead to uh, complications that are very similar to a patient with liver failure and cirrhosis, and that's what portal hypertension is. 
Next, if the JAK-STAT pathway is dysregulated, it can lead to inefficient hematopoiesis. What that means is the bone marrow is just not working well. It's not producing the right stem cells or leading to all the specific cells I showed earlier a few slides ago. So if your stem cells not working or the right cells are not being formed, it can lead to cytopenias, and that means just low blood counts. So this could be um, low blood counts, or it can be high or too many blood counts. So you can have many different type of problems. The main problem that does occur with too many blood counts um, is thromboembolism, which are blood clots. And blood clots from myelofibrosis or any of the myeloproliferative neoplasms can occur anywhere, not just the legs and the hands, but can occur in the lungs or the blood vessels in your abdomen. Um, and you can also lead to excessive bleeding and bruising. Lastly, um, with the dysregulation of this jack stat pathway, um, inflammation can occur. When inflammation occurs, it leads to what we call constitutional symptoms. These are um, ways that your body copes with inflammation. That can include fever, it can include itching, it can include just pain or just general unwell feeling. And if things keep on occurring, um, they can lead to infection. So this slide is a very uh, nice slide that kind of describes the timeline that we discuss in a patient with myelofibrosis. Um, in, 2000 and, uh, sorry, in 2016, um, the WHO, which is the World Health Organization, um, basically split uh, myelofibrosis into um, two different categories. It's defined as early, M, sorry, early MF or early M. MF is basically primary myelofibrosis, so PMS is myel primary uh, myelofibrosis. So that's one stage, and there's something called avert um, primary myelofibrosis. It, both of these are, by definition, myelofibrosis. The avert myelofibrosis just means that there's more fibrosis within the bone marrow, which means that there's just more problems to begin with and more complications that can occur. So on timeline is that when patients are diagnosed, um, sometimes they're diagnosed in this early primary myelofibrosis standpoint. And then the lead time is typically years. Um, they could have uh, vascular events, meaning uh, blood clots. And so some patients, um, when they come to see me with the diagnosis of myelofibrosis or when we're talking about it, they remember a, a few years back they've had a um, a blood clot of unknown reason or cause. And that was just part of their myelofibrosis uh, problem. So before I made the diagnosis, a patient could have had the diagnosis for many, many years prior and just unknowingly uh, myelofibrosis because we just didn't have a blood count abnormality. After several years' time, you can have something called overt myelofibrosis um, this is also patients that have transformed, meaning progressed from essential thrombocytosis or polycythemia vera. The natural progression of PV or ET is to slowly transform or progress into myelofibrosis, and that is under this overt category. So um, there are different things that you can see. You can have progressive constitutional symptoms and progressive organomegaly and extramedullary hematopoiesis. These two will lead to decrease in quality of life and decrease uh, capacity um, to perform your day-to-day -day function. Although we talked about having increased blood counts in the beginning, and that can occur with myelofibrosis, eventually, once your bone marrow gets tired out, um, it leads to cytopenias, which are low blood counts. And low blood counts can lead with a, to a specific complications, such as the constitutional symptoms and um, with the um, enlarged spleen and liver and EMH can all lead to specific symptoms and complications. If these complications are not recognized early, it can uh, lead to death. Um, what the treatment for myelofibrosis is to hopefully halt and slow the transformation to acute leukemia and usually that's acute myeloid leukemia, and that's why 
this graph goes from this early myelofibrosis to overt myelofibrosis to more complications to acute leukemia and premature death. Um, this is uh, something that um, is used uh, throughout the country. It's called the myeloproliferative neoplasm system, system sorry, uh, symptom assessment form. In short, it's called the SAS. Many physicians will use this form or ask questions on these forms to really see how bad your myelofibrosis is. Um, upon treatment, the goal is that you would have improvement with these symptoms. And these, um, this is a survey that's been vetted um, through um, patients with myelofibrosis or myeloproliferative disorders, and the goal is to see improvement over time. What labs do you expect to see uh, with patients with myelofibrosis that are abnormal? Um, the first laboratory finding is anemia. Most patients have a low hemoglobin, usually less than 10. There is aniso and poikilocytosis. That's just a fancy word of when you look at your red blood cells under a microscope, there are many different shapes and sizes of the red blood cells. The specific um, type of red blood cell that's seen is what we call a tiered shape or teardrop shaped red blood cell. This uh, particular cell looks like someone has cried basically and it's the shape of a tear. Um, there are also early um, uh, red blood cells and those are the nucleated red cells. Um, another common um, a blood uh, smear finding is what we call a leukoerythroblastocytosis, uh, and what that means is there's immature white blood cells and nucleated red cells in the circulating blood that we don't expect. And I'll have a picture out of each one of these. Um, your white blood cell and platelet count can be variable, and there's usually increased circulating CD34 precursor cells. What that means is that there's usually increasing, uh, sorry, increased circulating blast that's seen in the periphery. Um, the bone marrow biopsy, when obtained, will, um, will show increase in fibrosis. Uh, when I perform bone marrow biopsies in patients with myofibrosis, bone marrow biopsies are usually a little bit more difficult because the bone marrow itself is so fibrotic, it's harder to get that liquid portion, that aspirate out. And so the bone marrow, because of all the fibrosis, there are genetic mutations that are expected to be seen, and the big uh, one that we'll talk about is the JAK2 mutation, and this occurs approximately in 50% of patients. This is, um, the next few slides are examples of what you expect to see on, on the blood smear. This is a picture of someone's <clears throat> peripheral blood, and I'm going to use this cursor aerial, and I'm pointing to specific red cells and highlighting them. These are what we call those teardrop cells. These literally look like a tear, and these occur because when patients' red cells are being forced out of the bone marrow with the fibrosis, they develop these odd shapes, and that's the um, teardrop cells, or dacrocytes. The next cell here is the erythroleucoblastic blood smear. This blood smear occurs with um, the teardrop cells, again, and that's what I'm highlighting right now, there are some nucleated red cells or cells that actually have additional material in. One that I'm pointing to right now is you can see there's additional stuff inside the red blood cell. And this giant cell here is a blast. These are abnormal cells that we don't expect to see and should not see um, on the peripheral blood. <clears throat> this is a picture of someone's um, bone marrow. Um, like I said, you oh, we normally obtain the liquid and a solid portion, and so the uh, the solid portion, the core component, when you stain it with a particular reticulant stain, you could see this fibrosis, and this all these kind of black lines here are um, the fibrosis. Fibrosis is basically measured uh, by eye. Um, it's measured by a trained hem uh, hematopathologist and it's measured from a scale of zero to three. Zero is without any fibrosis, and three is the most severe. This patient 
has a lot of fibrosis and there's a lot of crisscrossing of the fibrosis and that will occur um, in advanced fibrosis. So this is stage or grade three fibrosis. This next slide is very um, busy. Um, I apologize. I have a few tables that have a lot of information on them. And my goal is not to read them verbatim to you, but basically to provide a resource um, so that you can go back to the article or um, have them that you could look at later. This um, figure is taken from um, a recent publication by uh, a Tessieri in Blood in 2016. And uh, on the very right column here, um, the right two columns are uh, the myelofibrosis. And this, this uh, reviews the 2016 WHO uh, diagnostic criteria. So the first column here is polycythemia vera. The second column is essential thrombocytosis. And we're going to focus on the last two because they're myelofibrosis. And this is the overt and this is the prefibrosis. And so what patients need are um, are these uh, major criteria which are listed above this gray uh, row, and and there are some minor criteria that's listed as well. So for um, the overt uh, myelofibrosis, the major criteria include on bone marrow biopsy, you would see some megakaryocyte or platelet proliferation or atypia. So platelets must look different. They need to have at least fibrosis that's seen in the bone marrow. That's your first grade, uh, first uh, criteria. Your second criteria is that a patient does not meet any WHO criteria for any other mild proliferative neoplasms. You just need to make sure that you don't meet PV or ET's diagnosis. The third is that you should have a mutation that's found. And that's the JAK2, CALR, C-A-L-R, or MPL mutation. We're going to go through mutations very closely um, afterwards. Um, there are other mutations that are not listed here that's listed in a future slide. And you have to have absence of evidence of reactive bone marrow fibrosis. Um, this is a good time to review that there are other reasons to cause increased fibrosis in the bone marrow other than just from myelofibrosis. Just to name a few, um, other cancers can cause myelofibrosis, um, vitamin deficiencies, um, other infections can cause uh, uh, fibrosis within the bone marrow. So just because you have advanced and a high-grade fibrosis doesn't mean you have the definition or diagnosis of myelofibrosis. So you just, a trained hematologist will need to go through a good medical history to make sure that you don't have any other reasons to have fibrosis within the bone marrow. Minor criteria listed here at the bottom, they include anemia, an increased white blood cell count, a palpable, meaning a spleen that could be felt on physical exam, an increase in LDH, which is a, a blood marker, and then that uh, leukoerythroblastosis uh, blood smear. So these are the criteria, major and minor, for <clears throat> uh, myelofibrosis. This next slide here talks about the common workup. And so if I'm concerned about myelofibrosis for a patient, these are the things that I would um, go over. I would perform a detailed history and physical. In the physical, I would specifically look for an enlarged spleen, liver, and lymph nodes. I would also do a detailed evaluation of any previous blood clots or bleeding events, um, any history of cardiovascular issues, in a transfusion, namely a red blood cell and platelet history. Um, other markers in a blood work I would want would be a complete blood count, a comprehensive panel that includes liver function and kidney function, an LDH, and a genetic test that's called a BCR ABLE. This is the specific genetic test that looks for the Philadelphia chromosome that would diagnose chronic myeloid leukemia. Chronic myeloid leukemia is treated very differently than myelofibrosis, so this test is very important to obtain first. A blood smear to look to see how the blood looks under the microscope, a bone marrow biopsy, and specific molecular testing that's obtained with the bone marrow biopsy, 
Um, like I already showed with uh, the myeloproliferative neoplasms, the, uh, the symptom assessment form, and other blood tests includes the erythropoietin level, iron studies, and coagulation studies. Those studies are very important uh, for prognosis and for treatment options. This uh, diagram uh, compares um, all the uh, specific uh, myeloid disorders, uh, chronic myeloid disorders, and I, what I want to focus on right now is the myeloproliferative neoplasm and specifically the myelofibrosis. And if you look here, um, what's important is the, the, the mutation. And just like that Venn diagram picture, I thought this, um, this graph really showed um, what happens with the blood smear when you look at the different disorders, and you can see that there's so many combinations, and there's so many overlaps. And these are the specific mutations that occur. And the ones that we're looking for most, the top three, are this JAK2, calreticulin, and NPL mutation. The three together combine 90% of our patients with myelofibrosis. So the main mutations, like I just talked about, are what we term as quote-unquote driver mutations. These mutations are the ones that we really think that affect that jak stat pathway, which leads to this myelofibrosis um, diagnosis and complication. So the main three, like I said, are the JAK2. The JAK2 occurs in 50% or 50 uh, to 55% of patients. The calreticulin mutation occurs in approximately 25% of patients. And then this NPL mutation occurs approximately in 8% of patients. There is a small type, small group amount of patients right here that are non-mutated, and that is um, what we call the triple negative, meaning without mutations, and that is, occurs in approximately 9% of patients. Um, this triple negative group is a higher risk group, um, and they have typically um, uh, worse prognosis. Um, the one mutation that's shown uh, to have a better prognosis is the calreticulin mutation. Uh, this mutation occurs usually in patients with younger age. They uh, do occur with higher platelets, and they do have a lower uh, prognostic uh, score, and so we'll go through all that as well. Um, this slide kind of reviews over the same things that we've talked about, but from a genetic standpoint, I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time. Now, this slide is very busy as well, but these, this slide includes all the other mutations that are important with myelofibrosis. And um, the specific mutations are listed on the very left here, and the uh, myelofibrosis uh, column is basically the second one from the right. So what we talked about two slides ago was the driver, those three main mutations. These other mutations are less important. However, they do have predictive values for patients with myelofibrosis. For example, the big one that I want to highlight right now is this ASXL1. This particular mutation um, occurs approximately 13 to 32 percent of the time, but it does predict um, it has issues with lower survival rates, and it does predict to a higher leukemia transformation rate. Another uh, mutation is this SRSF2. This, uh, this is very similar to this ASXL1, which occurs with a lower overall survival and an increased rate of leukemia transformation. Um, this bottom mutation, this TP53 mutation, it occurs with a worsening of overall survival as well. So as you can see, that there's many things that go into this formula, and these are things that we're learning more and more about. And I would strongly make sure that these mutations are checked uh, upon a diagnosis. And it's not something that's usually checked um, in the recent uh, few years. It's something that's been... Uh, more common, um, sorry, let me, re let me rephrase that. It's not been checked in, well in the past. It's only in the recent few years that these mutations are becoming more standard of care in practice. So moving on from diagnosis, 
I'm going to talk about prognosis. The main scoring system um, that I'm going to be talking about is called the Dynamic International Prognostic Scoring System Plus model. It's DIPS SS Plus for short. Now, if you go online, there are approximately five or six specific scoring systems for myelofibrosis, just like there are for MDS or any other um, disease. And, but this is a main one that's used a lot for clinical trials, that's used a lot for the WHO, so that's the one I'm focusing on. So it's the DIPS Plus model. And what the DIPS Plus model looks at are all these specific factors which are in the bubbles around this main box. So going from the left here, um, basically patients get a point for each one of the factors that they meet. So uh, fa th this uh, model includes age above 65, a platelet count less than 100, hemoglobin less than 10, any need for red blood cell transfusion, if you have presence of constitutional symptoms, if you have circulating peripheral blasts that are greater than 1%, if you have an unfavorable karyotype or set of genetics from the bone marrow, or if you have a white blood cell count of greater than 25,000. So you get a point for each one of these specific uh, points here. And the more points that you have, the higher risk that you have with the DIPS plus score. The DIPS plus score goes from low risk to high risk. If you have no risk factors, you are considered low risk for myelofibrosis, and you can see that your median overall survival is measured in decades. It's 15.4 years. However, the more points that you get, for example, if you have four or more risk factors, you're considered high risk, and your median survival drops from that 15.4 years to 1.3 years. There are many things that we can do to kind of augment this overall survival, but it's meant to show you that the more points that you get here, there's things that have to occur a little bit more urgently so that um, this progression to acute myeloid leukemia does not occur. Um, this table looks at the DIPS plus scoring system and puts it on a graph here. And it's basically what we just discussed, is that this top yellow line is if you have zero risk factors or you have low risk. And this red line at the very bottom is high risk patients. So higher risk patients has a shorter survival time compared to your lower risk patients. And so this scoring system has been very helpful for me when I'm meeting a patient for the first time to kind of judge where they, where they are in a specific um in their specific diagnoses, and so I can best um, give them treatment options and help. Um, this is a graph that's, um, that's been newly published, and this looks at specific mutations and how it, uh, how it affects your um, survival. So this talks about those three main driver mutations. So remember how I spoke about this CALR mutation, the CALR mutation? That was that good mutation. So if you have that mutation, you have the highest chance of survival. Your median overall survival is now 17.7 .7 years. However, those other mutations, the JAK2 mutations or the NPL mutations, your, your survival um, drops compared to that CAL reticulin mutation, but it's still measured in nine years or so. If you're considered triple negative, if you don't have those three mutations, then your prognosis, based on experience, is theoretically um, the lowest at 3.2 years. Now, obviously, what I try to tell patients, and I'm very careful, is that I'm presenting a lot of data, and every patient is very different. And so these, this, all this data represents patients that are all comers. It's not... Uh, individualized for a particular patient. So this will give you a general idea, but it does not say that this affects all patients with high risk or something. Uh, you need to speak to your physician partic uh, and specifically um, to have a prognosis and a treatment plan that's tailored specifically uh, for you. Um, this next graph 
just a look at um, calreticulin mutations to show that there's two different types, uh, but this type 1 mutation has an increased median overall survival, and that's the one that occurs more often. Um, the non-driver mutations are those other ones that I talked about, which are the ASXL1 mutation, the SRSF2 mutation, and this EZH2 mutation. These particular mutations are the ones that are shown in red, and those do show that having these mutations do uh, usually are associated with a decreased uh, survival. This um, next table is um, taken from the NCCN, um, and the NCCN uh, website has a bunch of guidelines in the model for list of neoplasms. They show the specific mutations to be concerned about. I already went through um, all these mutations with you. It's just all in one specific table for your um, uh, for your reference. So now um, there's been a lot more data that has been um, presented in terms of prognosis with genes and chromosomal analysis. So that DIPS plus scoring system that I talked about used cytogenetics, which is the DNA that's seen large scale from chromosomal mutations um, based on your bone marrow. However, all these additional genetic mutations I just talked about are not incorporated in your um, um, your DIPS plus scoring system. Because of that, um, Dr. Teferi from uh, the Mayo Clinic just published um, in 2016 a kind of revised DIPS plus scoring system. What he uses is a DIPS plus scoring system risk assessment, but then ties it with a molecular risk. So having what I just talked about, the DIPS plus plus the molecular risk together, you could kind of just find your way to give you a kind of a guide to your treatment. And so what this, to sum up this table, not to review, read everything word by word, is that if you're lower risk, it is okay not to receive treatment, but just to watch and watch your blood counts and wait for symptoms to occur. And if you're very high risk, is to start some sort of treatment and to consider an allogeneic stem cell transplant. And we will get into treatment in the next section. This graph um, I find is um, pretty uh, insightful at looking at specific mutations. This is a little bit old. It was published in 2013. And it looked at your main driver mutations. And so, and also um, how you progress. So most patients do start off with myelofibr, sorry, start off with polycythemia vera. And these patients have a chance 10% per 10 years will develop into myelofibrosis. Um, essential thrombocytosis, um, that transformation is a little bit less. It's usually a little bit like 7 to 9% of patients, um, sorry, 7 to 9% of patients will develop myelofibrosis in 10 years. And those patients with myelofibrosis, about 8 to 23% of those patients every 10 years will develop acute myeloid leukemia. So you can see that this myelofibrosis is definitely um, has the higher risk to acute myeloid leukemia. Because of that, for patients with ET and polycythemia vera, because they have a low risk to go to acute myeloid leukemia, we do not recommend stem cell transplant for those patients. Because if they develop into myelofibrosis, we have time to treat the myelofibrosis before uh, going into acute myeloid leukemia, and that's when we would recommend a stem cell transplant. Once the patient hits um, and gets receives the diagnosis of myelofibrosis, then that will um, really, um, um, a stem cell transplant will really need to be in consideration at that time. All right, um, I'm going to go over to our next section, which is treatment. And like what I already said, the big disclaimer is that this treatment is just treatment in general. It's not to be personalized um, for any one person in particular, but this will give you a kind of a good overview of treatment options. There's one graph by Dr. Teferi kind of goes through everything all together. 
the one thing I do want to state before moving on is that the only cure for myelofibrosis fibrosis is through an allogeneic stem cell transplant. It's basically removing your own stem cells, receiving stem cells from someone else, and being able to um, get a whole new immune system, so to speak. So what should happen is if you receive a diagnosis of myelofibrosis, fibrosis, we should apply that scoring system, the DIPS plus scoring system. And we could also use the Dr. Trafiri's um, molecular additional markers on top. If you have a low risk um, and you're asymptomatic, I recommend observation. Patients um, sometimes feel like and feel pressured that they need to receive treatment right away when they have a diagnosis of mild fibrosis. That's definitely not the case. Just like with myelodysplastic syndrome or any other symptoms, if you're asymptomatic and your blood counts are normal, just because you have mild fibrosis doesn't mean that you need to receive urgent treatment. Um, you can be watched very closely and receive serial blood counts and once symptoms or blood counts um, abnormalities occur, then that's when treatment should be indicated. If you have intermediate one risk, um, at that and if you're symptomatic, treatment should um, be considered. And what I recommend is treatment targeted to the specific symptom. So this graph shows all the treatment that's possible for anemia. If you have an enlarged spleen and symptoms that occur from that, these are the specific treatments that are there. Uh, constitutional symptoms, there's treatment that's listed here as well, and other supportive therapies um, for the other cytopenias that occur. We're going to go through all of this uh, slide by slide over the next few slides. However, if you're not symptomatic and you have an intermediate once risk, um, you could ask your physician, uh, your oncologist, to see if stem cell transplant may be appropriate at that time. Usually, um, when stem cell transplant's a little bit less optional is when patients have an intermediate two or higher risk um, score, then stem cell transplant should definitely occur. Um, if there are any high or increased blasts, those blasts need to be removed before heading to stem cell transplant. And, but more often than not, there's not too many high blasts despite having a high risk, and patients can proceed to stem cell transplant as soon as the donor is available, and then the patient is clear to head to stem cell transplant. So moving on, we're going to talk about all the different options. The first thing, like I said, is observation. What I recommend is that you monitor signs and symptoms, and this occurs usually every three to six month period. I just want to keep a close eye every six months at maximum. Uh, to uh, make sure that there's no increase or there's no changes in your blood counts or symptoms. Um, I've already said that stem cell transplant is the only cure for myelofibrosis. Um, there's two different types of stem cell transplant available, and um, I'm not a stem cell transplant physician, but I work very closely to one. And basically, as if you are older, you would receive a reduced intensity transplant. If you're um, younger, you may be eligible for a myeloblative, which is a strong uh, dose of chemotherapy prior to really um, get rid of those uh, bad stem cells. And all the specific medications um, we'll talk about soon. Uh, stem cell transplant, I just have about three slides on that, just to touch on it, just to be complete. Um, it is the only curative option. However, it does have the highest risk of complication because of graft-versus-host disease and high-dose chemotherapy. The most critical thing about stem cell transplant is the timing. Um, you would want to head to stem cell transplant when you're the healthiest so that you can get out of stem cell transplant and healthy and uh, basically recover from being in the hospital. However, you don't want to head to stem cell transplant too early because you don't want to perhaps hit some of the um, complications earlier than needed. So you have to have a very in-depth discussion with your primary oncologist and also see a stem cell transplant physician um, to discuss those pros and cons. What I recommend for my patients is um, to see a stem cell transplant physician early at intermediate one stage um, 
and or above, and just to have heard the information. And so when stem cell transplant is 100% necessary, um, a referral can be made, or you can head to stem cell transplant faster because you've already met a physician. Um, and this is what I've already just uh, this, uh, said, is that intermediate two and high risk patients should head to stem cell transplant if possible. If you're intermediate one, what would push me over to stem cell transplant is if a patient had very high and or high risk cytogenetics or those molecular uh, mutations, or if there's severe cytopenias requiring multiple uh, blood and platelet transfusions, um, if you have severe um, uh, platelet issues that lead to bleeding. This is a nice table that kind of talks about um, all the factors that lead to stem cell transplant. And so um, there's patient factors, there's the myelofibrosis disease factors itself, and there's transplant factors. So reasons to head to stem cell transplant earlier is if you are healthier, you um, don't have any comorbidities, that you um, have a higher risk of leukemia transformation but not has transformed yet, and if you have a well-matched donor, then you are considered a good transplant candidate, which can lead to a potential cure. But the risk, like I said, it could lead to decreased quality of life due to graft versus host disease, recurrent event, infection, or even early death. If you're not a stem cell transplant candidate or if you decide you do not want to consider a stem cell transplant, other therapies, namely, are a JAK inhibitor therapy or clinical trials. And JAK inhibitor therapy is not the only therapy that's available, but that's the main one, and that's why it's listed here in this box. Okay, um, outcomes of stem cell transplant. The best stem cell transplant is from a HLA, which is a matched um, uh, sibling um, or other related type of donors. Um, if you have a well much unrelated donor, you do a little bit less well, and if you have partially or mismatched unrelated donor, those patients are a little bit, have more complications. And what you can see here is that if you do um, head to stem cell transplant, you can have a very high chance of survival um, and you can get that cure. This graph just looks at outcomes, uh, meaning survival. It does not talk about complications or um, side effects from stem cell transplant. Now, let's talk about specific uh, treatment for uh, myelofibrosis other than stem cell transplant. Um, if you have specific symptoms, what I recommend is just symptom-related treatment. So uh, if patients have anemia, you can consider red blood cell transfusions. There's um, some effects, uh, adverse effects, which due to immune mechanisms, iron overload, or volume overload due to the red cells that you receive. If you have low platelet counts, platelet transfusions could be an option, and that can, um, the big side effects include transfusion reactions and also immune-related HLA sensitization uh, problems. This um, uh, next few slides look at, looks at MDS data, but it's also very helpful because patients with myelofibrosis can also receive what we call ESAs. ESA stands for erythroid stimulating agent. It's basically a steroid or hormonal shot to increase your red cells for production. So ESAs have been used a lot in myelodysplastic syndrome and also myeloproliferative disorders, specifically um, myelofibrosis. And if ESAs are used in the correct context, um, it works approximately 40% of, uh, of the time for all patients. There is a scoring system um, called the hillstrom lindbergh scoring system to uh, determine whether you may be a better or a worse candidate to um, respond to a um, steroid hormonal um, factor for um, your red blood cells. If you have um, a low hormone level in your body to begin with, and if you um, need less than two units of red blood cells per month, you have a very high chance of responding. You have a good response rate 
to an erythrostimulating agent. However, if you have a very high baseline hormone level in your body, and if you need more than two units of blood per month, then unfortunately your chance of responding to a growth hormone uh, is much lower, at approximately 7%. So it's important to kind of calculate the score to see whether um, your growth hormone is uh, a, is worth a shot um, for you. So for patients with anemia only, what I always recommend is make sure you assess all potential causes of anemia. There are many reasons, such as nutritional causes, that can lead to anemia, and those could be easily uh, fixed. But if you are symptomatic, I do recommend red blood cell transfusion support. Um, if red blood cell transfusion support occurs more than once a month, these steroid hormones can be very helpful. These steroids are injections that occur about once every two to three weeks, and um, they best occur, like I said, with a low hormone level and a low uh, red blood cell transfusion requirement. Um, you, you need approximately 10 to 12 weeks trial to see if this works. If there's not a response, then I recommend um, alternative treatments. Danazol, or an alternative steroid, are very effective agents for anemia-only myelofibrosis. Um, other agents include lenalidomide or thalidomide. These IMIDs, these this, these medications are in a group of medications called IMIDs. These uh, immunomodulators um, are very good at um, um, helping fix anemia but can cause a low platelet count as a complication. And these also need to be tried approximately uh, two to three months before calling quits as well. And a clinical trial could be an option. I get many questions about iron chelation. Uh, patients are always concerned. Well, I'm receiving so many play, uh, so many red cells. Um, I'm going to have too much iron, and that is the case if you start off very young and you receive a lot of red cells. But the average age of diagnosis is, you know, um, about 67 to uh, 70 years old. So at that at that time, iron overload and its effects are not seen until for decades. So iron overload is not my biggest concern all right from the get-go. The only time I recommend iron chelation, meaning a medication to remove excess iron in a patient, are patients who are younger, who receive a lot of red blood cells uh, per month. They have a high serum ferritin level, and also they are candidates for a stem cell transplant. If you don't have a large, huge life uh, expectancy, or if you're not a transplant for a stem cell candidate, iron chelation is very burdensome. It is not only expensive, but leads to a lot of GI side effects that um, the uh, side effects may outweigh benefits uh, for iron chelation. Um, going back to that same slide, now what I'm going to be focusing on are other symptoms. So we talked about treatment for anemia. Now I'm going to be focusing on treatment for symptoms specifically splenomegaly. So this graph that was published by Dr. Mesa. He is a myelofibrosis um, clinical champion at uh, University of Texas in San Antonio. And so um, what he uh, kind of picked, uh, had a picture here is that if you have symptomatic splenomegaly, it's important to uh, determine if your uh, revised uh, IPS score, the higher your score, and if you're a candidate for stem cell transplant, you want to go to stem cell transplant as soon as possible. However, if you're not a transplant candidate, there are some things that we can consider for splenomegaly uh, treatment. There are medical therapies, uh, drugs that are available. We can consider surgery, and we can also consider irradiation. Um, medical therapy is always my number one choice. Uh, my next slide will go through medical therapies. Um, splenectomy is always my last resort. When you remove a spleen from uh, a patient with myelofibrosis, um, it is that patient's extra bone marrow, so to speak. 
I, um, I said that if um, if you re I said that because the bone marrow is not working well to begin with, there's a lot of extramedullary hematopoiesis. Because of that extramedullary hematopoiesis in the spleen, if you remove the spleen, you're removing extra bone marrow that the body quote unquote needed. With the extra spleen bone marrow sort of so to speak removed, that can cause extra complications in lower counts. Removing the spleen only mildly improves your symptoms. There's no overall survival benefit shown, and it does not alter the disease course. Um, and I only use it, uh, I use, only use a splenectomy as a last resort, or if a patient's using a lot of narcotics for pain control, and we're just, we just don't, and we've already failed one previous uh, medical agent. Splenic radiation is something that's very good for extramedular extramedullary hematopoiesis. Radiation is very um, good at targeting these uh, areas and can be used regardless of location other than just in the spleen itself. Um, it's good, but the effect is very short and it's, um, it could create very mild suppressive effects, meaning that it could lower your, uh, all your blood counts. So you can see that I'm trying to paint a picture is that medical therapy should be your first uh, therapy in to try to stick with that therapy if possible. So medical therapy is you want to look at um, your spleen and if you have anemia to begin with. So if you just have uh, if you just have uh, sorry if you just have an enlarged spleen without an anemia and your actual um, bone marrow is okay meaning with a normal platelet count, then I would, the first step should be basically hydroxyurea. Hydroxyurea is, uh, has a 50% chance of reducing your spleen. It works about 50% of the time. It, um, you can only use it if you have adequate platelet and red blood cell count. Um, and you need to try this at least two to three months and the effect can last for approximately a year or two. I have patients who have actually been on uh, hydrea for approximately two to three years and has effectively reduced the spleen and its enlarged spleen side effects. Other um, treatment options include uh, thalidomide and prednisone. This medication is used, but you uh, have to be very careful about the platelet count. Um, this can drop your platelet count, and that's why you have to be careful about it. Thalidomide is a great medication. Um, it is used in combination with prednisone, and it really is effective to uh, not only for anemia purposes, but to um, um, to improve your um, and reduce your spleen volume. Um, other medications that are listed on this table are busulfan and alkylators. This is a uh, medication that. Uh, can lead to increased blasts um, subsequently. So this was published in 2009, so this Busulfa is um, kind of a last medication resort. Um, cladribine and azacitidine have been used and has been relatively successful. Um, about 30 to 40 percent of patients um, have success in reducing their spleen size um, with, um, um, with these two medications. All right. Moving onwards, uh, what I do want to spend uh, some time on is to talk about ruxolitinib or Jacophy. This is the only medication that has been really um, shown to be very effective for um, myelofibrosis. There's two major trials um, that really looked at, uh, there's been more than two trials, but uh, the two major ones that got uh, Jacophy or uh, ruxolitinib approved is this Comfort 1 trial and this Comfort 2 trial. Both of these trials were randomized and blind, um, uh, were randomized to ruxolitinib or placebo or ruxolitinib plus uh, best uh, alternative therapy by um, the physician. And what it really has shown was that ruxolitinib really was great at number one, reducing the spleen by greater than 35% reduction at week 24. And or 48 based on MRI and CT scan. The next few slides will go through the results of these trials uh, from a high-level overview standpoint. Um, Ruxolitinib, like I said, showed reduction in spleen 
exercise and an improvement in myelofibrosis-related symptoms. Quality of life surveys have shown improvement with ruxolitinib, and there was also overall survival benefit with ruxolitinib. So in the Comfort 1 study, you could see that patients on ruxolitinib had an increase in overall survival compared to placebo. So ruxolitinib is this higher, darker shaded line. And the higher the, the higher the line to the top indicates increased survival. Um, they also looked at patients whether you're JAK2 positive or JAK2 negative, and it, regardless, patients with ruxolitinib uh, had increased survival despite uh, being JAK2 positive or negative. It's, it's very uh, interesting because ruxolitinib is a JAK um, inhibitor. Even not having the specific protein, patients can benefit. So um, because you're JAK negative does not mean you're not a candidate for ruxolitinib or that it would not work. Um, the Comfort One did show that there was incidence of increased incidence of uh, anemia and thrombocytopenia for ruxolitinib, and that's the major side effects. In fact, that we have to dose ruxolitinib very carefully based on your platelet count. So there is an increased um, risk of anemia and uh, thrombocytopenia with uh, the ruxolitinib. However, over time, what it did show was that. Um, and that's the next slide here, um, is that despite having more grade 3 and 4 um, anemia and thrombocytopenia, that all these cytopenias occurred the most basically in the very beginning, um, and within the first six months. Um, after six months on therapy, when the ruxolitinib has really had its chance to reduce the spleen size and has its effect uh, for the symptoms, patients, um, anemia and thrombocytopenia does uh, improve afterwards. So cytopenias, meaning lower worsening of your anemia and thrombocytopenia does occur quite frequently, but occurs more often in the first six months. You just have to get through the first few months uh, in order to reap the rewards of ruxolitinib. This is what I, I tell all my patients is that do not stop the medication early. If you stop the medication early, you only, unfortunately, get the side effects and don't have any improvement with um, ruxolitinib. This next slide here looks at, <clears throat> excuse me, um, looks at spleen reduction. And how this chart looks at is that uh, baseline here is this kind of uh, middle line at 0%. If a patient's spleen was reduced in size, then your, um, you basically drop down from below. And if your spleen increased in size, it, you're above this line. So this is what we kind of call a waterfall plot. And each one of these lines vertically represent an individual patient. So you can see that approximately four-fifths of the patients on the ruxolitinib arm uh, received a good spleen reduction, and greater than 50% received a 35% or greater spleen reduction. Um, there was a small amount of patients that spleen did increase afterwards. Um, patients who crossed over, meaning that started off with placebo or started off with some sort of other treatment, um, crossed over and received ruxolitinib afterwards, they also were able to have a spleen reduction but it was not as dramatic as uh, those who started with ruxolitinib. Um, those with uh, a spleen reduction did have a durability, meaning that um, the chances of you maintaining a greater than 10% uh, percent of spleen reduction um, was a very long time. However, to continually maintain a greater than 35 spleen reduction percentage um, was a little bit less uh, optimal, and so um, that's something just to uh, look at. But what the study did show was that at the two-year mark, 64% of patients did re uh, maintain a greater than 35 percentage of spleen reduction with ruxolitinib. Um, this graph just looked at the quality of life surveys. Those patients on ruxolitinib did have increase in quality of life, the, goal, the global health status. The, the fatigue significantly improved with ruxolitinib, 
um, the patients was able to continue to do their job, their role, um, and have increased functioning and increased physical functioning with the ruxolitinib arm. The reason why the bottom placebo um, stops midway is that those patients did cross over and um, moved to the ruxolitinib arm. The COMFORT-2 trial um, basically is this one slide that I have listed here. And what it really does show is um, the same thing, is that those patients on ruxolitinib um, did have a, a sustained and a, um, a more dramatic spleen reduction than those who are um, receiving best supportive care not on ruxolitinib. So, to summarize, uh, ruxolitinib is associated with uh, with a um, um, survival advantage in the Comfort 1 and 2 studies. Um, the spleen um, does get reduced uh, quite uh, nicely in those um, those uh, those improvements were well maintained, and uh, the quality of life were also sustained for a extended period of time with spleen reduction on ruxolitinib. Um, the incidence of grade three, four anemia or low platelet counts um, does get decreased over time, but you do need to wait to the six month mark. After initiating ruxolitinib, most patients were able to be titrated on a slightly lower dose for longer-term treatment, and titration uh, was uh, done due to platelet count uh, variability. And the durability uh, efficacy and long-term safety of ruxolitinib occurs in all patients with mild fibrosis, whether or not a patient has the JAK2 mutation. Um, one thing that is, um, has been shown more recently is that Patients have a better chance of re, uh, responding to ruxolitinib if they have less molecular mutations. So if a patient has one or less molecular mutations, and those are all those mutations I listed in that big chart at the beginning of this presentation, if you have one or less mutations, uh, you have a very high chance of responding to ruxolitinib, and the time to discontinuation is measured in uh, years. However, if you have two or more greater mutations, those patients had a shorter time to t uh, treatment discontinuation and a shorter overall survival. So, in summary, the more mutations you have, the um, worse your chance is. Um, but not all mutations are created equal, and that's why I do recommend for you to always talk to a, um, a physician about your particular mutation if diagnosed with mild fibrosis. Special considerations for ruxolitinib is that the initial dose and dose modifications are largely based on a patient's platelet count. Uh, patients should be on it at minimum for eight to 10 weeks before discontinuation because like I said, all the side effects occur very early on. There's an increased risk of atypical infections, which are mycobacteria infections and hepatitis reactivation. Um, expected benefits and improvements all occur with um, ruxolinib, including constitutional symptoms, mild, uh, mild fibrosis-specific symptoms like early satiety, which is um, basically you, you feel full fast, itchiness and bone pain. Um, you see expected benefit, improvements in enlarged spleen and uh, something called a JAK2 allele burden. Um, what that means is that uh, further tests have shown that the amount of JAK2 a patient has decreases substantially with, uh, uh, with um, ruxolitinib. The, the science behind it, meaning um, your prognosis, is still up in the air, meaning that we think as uh, physicians that if your JAK2 allele burden has decreased, that's got to be a good thing. But it's not been shown um, from like a randomized controlled trial, that type of thing, and how that affects the clinical setting is still not used um, all the time. So many of us are, are checking just to see what the allele burden is, but to use it clinically right now outside of a clinical trial is, um, is still up in the air. Um, what Jacophy does not do um, 
is it does not affect bone marrow fibrosis or cytogenetic abnormalities, meaning that if your bone marrow has a lot of fibrosis inside, that stays there. Unfortunately, that does not get decreased with rexolitinib. Only future type of medications really have um, different um, um, uh, has, has the ability to decrease fibrosis and uh, impact cytogenetics. So moving on to our next section is clinical trials and future directions. Um, in short, we have to do better uh, because once a patient fails ruxolitinib or ruxolitinib does not work or if there's increased side effects, there's not much out there other than clinical trials right now, and there's many, many things that are being looked at. So um, the specific subtype that's most concerning is what we call advanced phases of myelofibrosis. There is a accelerated phase and there's a, bas uh, sorry, a blast phase. These phases are all defined by your blast count in the peripheral blood or the bone marrow, and these patients do a lot worse uh, compared to those with regular run-of-the-mill myelofibrosis. Um, these patients are treated much like myelodysplastic syndrome or acute leukemias, and they uh, should be treated with a hypomethylating agent, whether it's azacitidine or decitabine, intensive induction chemotherapy, a clinical trial, or an allogeneic, followed by an allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, so, like I said, what's beyond <clears throat> ruxolitinib at this time, there's a lot of different novel JAK inhibitors that are trying to improve its mechanism with a better toxicity profile. Um, there has been pre other JAK2 inhibitors looked at in the past, like better uh, titanib. Um, this is a medication that looked promising but is now off the market due to increased toxicities. Uh, Momo um, mom Momoleltinib, sorry, um, is in a current phase 2-3 trial right now that's looking uh, promising as well. Uh, Percritinib um, is being studied right now as it does um, have a chance to potentially decrease bone marrow fibrosis, which is very exciting for us. At the University of Virginia, um, Insight um, uh, has a um, specific um, a uh, drug that's uh, being looked at. It's a specific JAK1 uh, inhibitor um, that is being used in clinical trial right now. So it's something that is um, exciting. Um, ruxolitinib is also combined with a, with a lot of conventional medications in clinical trials. They include danazole, an erythrostimulating agent, lenalidomide, thalidomide, um, other agents such as azacitidine, um, the cytobine, and transplant. And there's other novel agents being uh, looked at, such as HDAC inhibitors, PI3 kinase uh, pathway inhibitor patients, uh, sorry, medications, and also immunotherapy. So there are a lot of different therapies that are available that were not available even just one or two years ago uh, and compare that to a decade ago. So the DIPS plus prognosis scoring system is a little bit older because it's kind of, it was published right when ruxolitinib was just available. So to be very honest, um, a newer revised scoring system should be out there so that uh, we can look at and to be able to better um, give prognosis um, estimations uh, to our patients. So moving on. Uh, to talk about um, our final conclusions. Um, the field of, of proliferative neoplasms and myelofibrosis is rapidly advancing with better understanding of genetics and prognosis right now. Um, as I've said already, timing to allogeneic stem cell transplant is critical. Um, you don't want to go to transplant too early or too late. Um, there are many different supportive therapies directed at symptoms and cytopenias. Although ruxolitinib is the first drug approved for myelofibrosis, it's still really the one that's being used more often right now. Uh, future research is still being done to look at novel agents to use it in addition or in substitution to ruxolitinib. 
Um, I really want to thank all of you guys for your time and um, uh, especially all our patients um, who give us the ability to study and to be able to um, treat and to be able to take care of, of, uh, of you guys. So we really appreciate the time. Thank you to the Aplastic Anemia MDS Foundation um, for giving me the opportunity to present. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, I, you can look me up at the University of Virginia website or feel free to email me um, and I'll be happy to speak to you about myelofibrosis, myelodysplastic syndrome, or myeloproliferative neoplasms. So thank you very much and I hope that you enjoyed um, our presentation. Thank you very much. And we did have just a couple of questions. That we've got just a few minutes left. Um, the first question is, what are the chances of relapse or developing AML after having a core blood transplant following MF? Um, that is a very complicated question. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fantastic one. Um, so the chance of relapse to um, myelofibrosis is very minimal. Most patients who um, develop and undergo um, stem cell transplant, if they have a secondary malignancy, will likely be myelodysplastic syndrome and or, or um, acute myeloid leukemia. Um, I could just give you generalities because it's very different based on patient. I would need to know specifically what risk factors a patient particularly had and also um, what uh, particular um, chemotherapies, um, what type of um, previous malignancies, because that would all kind of play into pictures. But if a patient is um, within the first, I'd say, five years after a core blood transplant, the chance of relapse is the highest during that time. I would estimate approximately 10 to 15 percent chance of relapse is there, um, but that's kind of not knowing the full uh, patient um, uh, treatment information. Once you really get past that five to 10 year mark, you're really out of that window where um, your chance of relapse does become a lot less. Um, to acute myeloid leukemia, um, there's always a chance for later myelodysplastic syndrome, and the chance will probably still be, I, I would say, about five or less percent, and that's just being very general right now. Uh, thank you. We did have a question um, if your slides were going to be available, and uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, you'll, they'll, the whole presentation will be available um, in seven uh, four to seven business days on our online academy. Um, another question we have is, do you have thoughts on taking, it's A-N-G-R-E-L-I-D-E, <laughs> um, to help control platelet count for MF post-ET patient that has low symptoms but high platelet count? Um, thank you for that question. That's a great question. Um, Inagrolide is a great uh, medication. Inagrolide, okay. Yes, um, for uh, platelet count um, control. It's a hard medication to uh, kind of dose uh, just because it can lead to some symptoms. Uh, but if you um, are taking the medication and are asymptomatic with it, anagrolide is a great medication to control platelets. Um, it's not good for any of the other um, high white blood cell count or anemia. So if it's just high platelet count, anagrolide is helpful. Um, you could consider um, the other agents that we talked about, which would be hydrea or lenalidomide or thalidomide. But honestly, if um, anagrolide is working well, I would just stick with that. And if things progress, then consider one of the other options. Okay, great. And our last question, um, and the patient said, okay, thank you. Um, the, our, the last question we would have is, if a, you mentioned earlier in the slides, if a patient is does fall under the category where they have the dual diagnosis, say, of myelofibros myelofibrosis and MDS, which of the diseases treated, how do doctors and patients decide what treatments the patients need to be on. Uh, thank you for that question. It's, that's um, 
a, a very um, tricky question, but there are specific subtypes which we, um, and it's, I think it was in the very, very beginning of my slide where or my presentation is when I actually uh, talked about um, overlap disorders where there's some, because MDS and mild proliferative neoplasms are so similar, there, there are many times when things overlap. And so, for example, chronic mild, mild monocytic leukemia, CMML, um, they are considered overlap disorders where you have part thing, a part of your diagnosis looks like myelodysplastic syndrome and part of your diagnosis looks like myeloproliferative neoplasm. And that myelod that myeloproliferative neoplasm could be the myelofibrosis component. So what I would really strongly recommend for any patient would be to have his or her bone marrow officially read by a large academic center with a hematopathologist that specializes just in myeloid disorders because it's very important to look at it to make sure that the correct diagnosis is made. But then for the oncologist and the patient to sit down, look at the blood counts, and look at the symptoms. And what I do is I try to figure out and tease out, does my patient, um, are they behaving more like a patient with myelodysplastic syndrome or myeloproliferative neoplasm? And then I would tailor treatment accordingly. Uh, mo most patients, if you have kind of that myelofibrosis component, you probably behave more like a proliferative neoplasm, meaning that you have higher counts. So I would treat more like the patients that I have already described with the hydroxyurea, with the counts, with the way to kind of decrease your counts. But sometimes things kind of transition and cross over to that other standpoint where you get all the low dysplastic counts and those other symptoms that we did not talk about during this lecture. But if that were the case, if you are being treated more like a myelodysplastic um, syndrome uh, di diagnosis, then that would lead me to treat with um, azocytidine or decitabine. Great. Thank you very much, and that is all the questions um, that we had today. I'd like to thank you very much for your wonderful presentation and your time today. Um, I would also like to add, if you would like to rewatch this webinar at a later time, be on the lookout for an email that will provide you with an archived link in four to seven business days. On behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, I would like to thank each of you for joining us today and making the foundation your resource of choice for information on bone marrow failure diseases. If, you were not, if we were not able to get to your question today, please send it to us via email at help at aamds.org so our patient educator can respond or visit our online academy for interviews with experts and other programs that may address your question as well. As a reminder, as soon as I'm done speaking, a post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. Please take time to complete the survey. Again, thank you for joining us, and remember, learning is hope. This concludes today's program.